Welcome everybody to uh, module three. Um, and uh, my name is Philip Rolf. I uh, will start in just a couple of minutes, give, give people time to arrive. Thank you for those who are here. So welcome everybody um, to this module three, an introduction to Connexus Rheometry. And um, I will I'll now start. Okay, so my name is Philip Rolf. I'm one of the rheology technical specialists here in NETCH USA, or NIB, in, in the Boston area. And um, we're going to be talking about different viscometry tests today. So in the previous module, in module two, we looked at how the software was organized uh, for the Connexus. And, um, and now today we're going to look at different viscometry types. So <clears throat> there's going to be two parts. One is uh, an introduction to viscosity measurements generally, and, um, and then viscosity flow curves specifically, and why you might use those and what the benefits of them are. And then in part B, we're going to look at viscosity measurements for yield stress and thixotropy measurement. So um, these come into the flow, beh flow behavior studies. So if uh, rheology is the study of deformation and flow, the science of deformation of flow, we're now looking at flow. So how the material is going to pump or paint or flow or spray, that sort of thing, uh, rather than what it's doing before it flows <clears throat> or after it's cured or that sort of thing. So um, let's go ahead here. So viscosity is defined as the resistance to flowing. And you can see uh, here we're going to apply um, a shear rate usually to a sample and see what stress is required or what stress it pushes back with and then from the shear stress divided by the shear rate you can calculate the viscosity so if you can use different measuring system types as we looked at in a previous module module one and you can clamp the sample between two cones or plates or in a cup and bob type geometry and we're going to shear the top one across the bottom one and the sample should hopefully move like a pack of cards and we can measure the viscosity of the sample. Now, shear rates come in a wide range, obviously. Now, um, we talk about this term, but it's good to know what shear rates actually kind of relate to. So if you think of sedimentation, it could be incredibly slow. It might take months for something to sediment. And so we'd be talking at very low shear rates. This could be 10 to the minus six, up to 10 to the minus four reciprocal seconds. And, um, and then if you look at sagging, something like that, that would be 10 to the minus three up to 10 to the minus one reciprocal seconds. And then uh, pumping, maybe one to a thousand. So obviously the sample comes into the pump quite slowly, it gets pumped around. And uh, there's some range of shear rates in this process. It's not just one shear, although there may be a maximum shear rate of a thousand or something like that. So most of these processes have a range of shears. Blade coating, this is where you're um, spreading a substrate, uh, a material across the substrate. And this is usually one to like 100,000 reciprocal seconds or spraying even. And these things you can all do on a Connexus rotational rheometer, which is you get to the high shears, use a very narrow gap, and you can shear that sample round and round very quickly with a narrow gap without it coming out from the plates. If you want to go over 100,000, often you're going to lose the sample. It will fly out or it won't flow very well or go into turbulence and things like that. So then we'd use a, a Roseanne capillary rheometer. And so you can generate even over a million reciprocal seconds because the sample has nowhere to go except through the die. So you can really squeeze on it very hard. And um, with a very narrow die, you can generate incredibly high shear rates. Now, the downside with the Roseanne is you can't get to very low shear rates. So maybe one reciprocal second will take quite a long time to generate the result. And these sedimentation things really just aren't possible. So what you want to do usually when you're looking at a sample is say, what's the most appropriate shear rate to test the sample at? So do we have, um, so a customer might say, this is a good sample, this is a bad one. And my test, my, my question to them would be, well, what differentiates good from bad flow behavior in this case? They say, well, it doesn't spray. Okay, fine. So spraying is then in the 10,000 to 100,000 reciprocal second range. So 
so I want to set up a rheometry test to look at this very high shear rate behavior. And if they say one is unstable in its sediments, then I'm going to go to the low shear rate behavior uh, or something in between, you know, for pumping. So you get an idea of what test is most appropriate. And if you look at the wrong shear rate range, the data may not be actually very meaningful to the problem that they're seeing. So it's a good idea to try to identify where the problem happens in a process. So um, you want to match the shear rate to the process. And some of you will have seen this example from previous modules. So for hand cream, in the life of hand cream, you've obviously got some storage time. And if this is flowing at all, it would be a very low shear rate. So we've got 10 to the minus three reciprocal seconds here. And um, this would be flowing very slowly. And then the next part would be when you pump it out of the bottle onto your hand. And it's going to go through about 10 reciprocal seconds as it's pumped or scooped. And then you have this moment when you look at it. And if it's very poor product, it drips off or flows away. And this will give you a kind of an aesthetic feel for the product. And then finally, you might rub this hand cream on your hands or on your body somewhere. And um, you can see if it's sticky or if it has a nice feel. If it's very shear thinning, it might go on easily and feel better. So that's um, a high shear rate, that's 100 reciprocal seconds. So you can look at all these different shear rates, <clears throat> but you'd wanna find the shear rate that's most applicable to the problem that the, the, the sample seems to have, which is a difference between a good and bad sample, where one doesn't pump and the other one does, or one sediment's in storage and the other one doesn't. <clears throat> so we've got three different types of flow behavior. We've looked at this before as well. Newtonian, shear thinning, or shear thickening. So Newtonian is where the viscosity doesn't really change, <clears throat> and it's independent of shear rate. So this is like oil or water, low viscosity solutions, think of milk, things like that. You can mix this stuff up, and it's the same viscosity after than it was before, unless you kind of make a foam out of it or something. But generally, the viscosity of the material doesn't change. Then some materials obviously are very shear thinning, so if you think of a hand sanitizer, it might have a gel-like property, but when you pump it, it becomes a low viscosity liquid. So it's clearly shear thinning. Or on shear thickening is if you have something that's quite fluid, but when you push it really fast, it just solidifies. That's quite rare, but it happens sometimes if you have too much filler or too many particulates in the sample. And maybe you've just about added that and made it act like a liquid, and when it's in best packing, there's enough liquid to fill it, the interstitial volume. But when you displace those particles, then, then it solidifies because there's not enough liquid to go around. <clears throat> so um, in the shear thinning flow curve, there's still another couple of divisions here. You can have samples with the yield stress. This is like the hand cream. And um, if you think of this, uh, this material, if I open the lid on this hand cream and you can see it's got fingerprints or finger marks on it from the last time you scooped some cream out, then clearly it's not flowed while it's been sitting in the cupboard and it has a yield stress. It resists flowing or it's solid-like when stationary. And then the, the other type might be the zero shear viscosity. So if you think of uh, honey, it flows very slowly. And uh, when you take that out of the refrigerator, it will maybe be smooth on the top. So it, it may be quite stiff to, to spread, but it does level out over time and it has liquid-like behavior when stationary. So when you do a flow curve, you're actually probing the different interactions in the sample, what structures are in there. So the low shear rate behavior looks at the weak forces. Maybe these are van der Waals or electrostatic forces in the material, repulsive forces between particulates, things like that. And then as you go to higher shear rates, you're gonna exert enough energy to start breaking down these stronger interactions. So if you have really strong agglomerates, you might see a viscosity drop here if they break only at higher shear rate. So you can see um, usually the stronger interactions occurring at higher speeds and the weaker at lower speeds. So viscosity flow curve is actually quite uh, telling, gives you a lot of information about the sample. So how do you test a sample? Well, you uh, we could go to the favorites list here in the software, 
and you see there's a lot of toolkit tests and then you can just click load sample and um, and then you hit start on whichever test you want and it will start the test so very quick and easy <clears throat> so if we click start on a flow curve test here it's going to ask you the start shear rate and the end shear rate and a number of points per decade um, so in this case we're going through three decades of shear 0.1 to 1 1 to 10 10 to 100 so if you did 10 points per decade we'll have a flow curve with 30 points on it you might say hey that's too many it's going to take me a while i would just want five points per decade and then you get 15 points on your flow curve if you do a linear progression actually then it just tells you uh, how many points you want in total and here we have a graph being generated with viscosity versus shear rate and the shear stress there in red so as we uh, press on forwards it's going up you can see the uh, the axes and the symbols if you want to change this to the whole words you just right click on the axis and say don't show symbols and it will show you the words instead so you can see shear viscosity shear rate shear stress now two different flow curve types. We had the hand cream, this is the blue graph. We can see the viscosity here versus the shear rate. And as we go to lower and lower shear rates, this material seems to get stiffer and stiffer and stiffer. So it's giving you solid-like behavior. So the hand cream has a yield stress. <clears throat> Whereas the shower gel is a liquid and actually it doesn't have a yield stress. So this is a sample that flows with time and so it has a plateau of viscosity. So um, you can see they're different at low shear rates, but at high shear rates, actually they get fairly similar in viscosity. So if you're just pumping this, or if you're just measuring it with a, a low cost viscometer, you may not be able to differentiate these samples very easily. You really need to look at these very low shears with a rheometer to see the big differences in them. So in this section, in summary, We've had a quick look at viscosity measurements and how you choose shear rates to mimic a process with the rheometer and then how you'd uh, put that shear rate into context and then we looked at the first of the three different measurement types so we looked at flow curves and in the next section we're going to look at yield stress and thixotropy so thank you very much for your attention and um, please let us know if you have any questions and we'll try to help I'm going to move straight on to uh, section 3B actually now. So my name is Philip Rolfe. These are going to be divided up into three different uh, modules. So we're going to ind individually introduce them. So um, this is section 3B, typical viscometry measurements, looking at yield stress and thixotropy. And um, I'm one of the technical specialists here in the US in Burlington in uh, Boston area. So in part A, we looked at viscometry tests and flow curve measurements particularly. And in part B, we're gonna look at yield stress tests and thixotropy tests. So yield stress, this is looking at a semi-solid or, or a solid type material. And um, initially this material may not seem to flow. So if you think of a toothpaste or um, tomato sauce, Initially, it seems like a, a, a semi-solid, and then when you exert more than a certain amount of force, it will flow. So in this case, the toothpaste is coming out of the tube, or the ointment onto the finger in here, or this could be the, um, the ketchup doesn't flow until you whack the bottle, and then it starts to flow. <clears throat> so this is known as a yield stress. And so we say that the material has a yield stress because it resists flowing, and so with a rheometer, where you have stress control, you can control the force on the sample rotationally. We're going to increase the stress with time in a linear ramp. And um, we, and we initially won't see any flow, and then suddenly the sample should start to flow. So if I look at the graph of viscosity versus shear stress, this would be a typical yield stress sample here in blue. And initially you push on the sample and the sample seems to pull back, right? And then you push a bit harder and it pulls back a bit harder. You push more and it pulls back more. And it's not really flowing, it's just stretching at this stage. And we're seeing elastic behavior. And then when you push hard enough, the material starts to flow. So 
the viscosity breaks down as you break down maybe some of the structures in the sample. And so if you um, if you look at this graph, you see from the peak of it, this is the yield stress point. So it's quite easy to see this if you plot viscosity versus shear stress. And the peak there indicates when it started to flow. Obviously, the rate of your ramping would um, would affect this. If you ramp very slowly, the yield stress might happen a bit lower. If you ramp very quickly, the yield stress might happen a bit more quickly. So this is an absolute is not an absolute um, rheological value. The yield stress is more dependent on the test method that you used. But you probably want to use a ramp rate which is similar to your process. So if you say I turn on my pump and I want the sample to flow in the first 30 seconds, then I would ramp from zero to whatever force in 30 seconds, and that would give me an idea of the right uh, yield stress that we need to overcome in the sample. Interestingly, here's another line for a sample without a yield stress. So if you think of uh, the, the, um, the, the shower gel, which was just flowing, it is shear thinning, but um, flows pretty easily all the time here. So no yield stress was measured in that case. So here's the, how you'd run the test. So you go to um, toolkit version 003, there's viscometry 003, and you run the ramp. So we hit start, and it will ask you for start and end stresses and the ramp time. So you need to kind of guesstimate what the end stress needs to be. So you obviously have to overcome the yield stress you've got to start below it and finish above it. So if you start at zero, you'll be safe. And if you finish anywhere above the yield stress, you should be safe. So you could do zero to a thousand or something, but usually want to kind of home in on the on the data that you want. So the yield stress of salad dressing is somewhere around 10. Toothpaste is about 200. And so you kind of guesstimate what the yield stress of your sample might be. So let's say we were looking at hummus. You could say, um, well, hummus is probably thicker than salad dressing, but maybe not quite as thick as the toothpaste, or maybe it is approaching toothpaste. So let's guess maybe hummus is 100 pascals. So if I ramp from zero to 200, I should capture somewhere in here the yield stress of the hummus. And we're going to use one minute 40 seconds. That's just 100 seconds of test. And we're going to ramp the stress up. And the viscosity is going up initially and then down, and there's a peak. Obviously, that indicates where the material started to flow. <clears throat> so here's results for hand cream. In this case, the hand cream flows pretty easily, and the yield stress is only 5 pascal. So this is actually half the yield stress of even ranch salad dressing. So it's quite a liquidy hand cream. Or a shower gel, here you see in this red bottle, doesn't have any profile on the top. So it does flow pretty easily. And you can see here, it's more of a flat curve. You can't really see a peak. And the fact that it's a flat line indicates that it doesn't even have a yield stress. It's just a viscous liquid. Um, so, so if you have a very sharp peak, that would show you it's a very elastic sample. If it's more of a smooth curve or, or a flat line, then you'd show it's more viscoelastic or even just viscous in this case. So the second type of test that we can measure in viscometry, sorry, the third type, because we did viscosity flow curves, and then yield stress, and now we're doing thixotropy. So the third type is thixotropy. Now, thixotropy is time-dependent shear thinning behavior. So if a sample seems to be shear thinning, but it actually takes a time to shear thin, then it's called thixotropic. So if you get a, a hand sanitizer, for instance, no, let's say hair gel, this is something that is shear thinning, but it rebuilds very quickly. Obviously, you, you rub a hair gel in your hair, and it needs to hold it in place. So it actually rebuilds immediately, and you just say it's a shear thinning material. But if you get a material that takes a while to recover, then that's known as thixotropic. So if you think of paint, um, if you've been to uh, your shed and open up an old tin of paint often you'll find the sample is like a jelly lump and then when you mix it, it becomes like a lower viscosity liquid and then if you leave it back in the shed again for another few weeks it will re-gel up um, obviously you want to paint it before it gels up <clears throat> so there's a rebuild time 
and that's known as its thixotropy. And um, sometimes this can um, really affect the sample's behavior. So if you think of paint, when you brush the sample, you want it to rebuild at a certain speed. So if you think of uh, before, we, we, we'll do a low shear step initially, and we'll see the initial viscosity as a baseline. Then we do a high shear step to simulate mixing or brushing, and you see the sample break down. And then we go back to a low shear step, and we'll watch the viscosity rebuilding. Now that would obviously rebuild eventually to the start stress if we didn't lose the sample. If the sample rebuilds too quickly, maybe it won't level out. Maybe it will leave you with brush marks on your paint and you won't get the nice smooth texture that you wanted. Or if you had a spray paint, maybe you'd see that orange peel effect that you sometimes see uh, with, a, with a cheap rattle can. <clears throat> In a good paint, hopefully the delay of rebuilding would allow it to level out. And so you'd get rid of all those textures and the surfaces and the striations and it will rebuild more slowly. So that would be a good paint here. Now, if it rebuilds really slowly, then obviously it's gonna run down the surface. So there's an optimum rebuild time, and that's somewhere not too fast, not too slow. And you can do this and quantify it with the rheometer system. So thixotropic measurements are very useful, but also they uh, can tell you exactly how the sample behaves. So in the sequence, we have three different steps. At stage one, stage two, and stage three, and these are user definable. The pre written sequence will have values in there that you can use, but if you're not sure, if you want to use specific values, you can just type in your own shear rates and times for each stage. So this is giving it 0.1 reciprocal seconds for stage three, and it's going to do that for 10 minutes, taking a point every two seconds. And you can see the samples rebuilding pretty quickly, probably could have ran it for less than 10 minutes there. This is um, <clears throat> a, a sample of um, indigestion liquid. This is a calcium carbonate suspension. And um, in this case, the material, I think, takes some time to rebuild. Um, you can see initially it's quite a thick liquid. And then when shaken up, it becomes a low viscosity material. But it rebuilds pretty quickly. They don't want it to be low viscosity for a long time because the material would sediment out and you would have a clear water or something, and then um, all, the, all the chalk would be at the bottom. So you want it to rebuild pretty quickly to be a stable dispersion. So in this case, it's starting around 10 Pascal seconds, breaks down to just under one, and then it rebuilds pretty quickly back up to about seven, and then fully probably in, in about 100 seconds. So you can see here from 80 maybe to 180, it's mostly recovered and maybe eventually in two or 300 seconds, we're back to the start point. So you get a really good quantification of thixotropy in this test. You can see how the structure is at the beginning, during shear, and then how quickly it recovers afterwards. So this is a great tool for the formulator. If they wanna know how much additive to add to build structure in something, if you wanna add a thixotropic or uh, bodybuilding material, into your sample to stop it sedimenting. This will, will help you add exactly the right amount of gel into there. Generically, we say the longer that the material takes to rebuild, the more thixotropic it is. And um, <clears throat> it also affects how long it takes for the sample to get a steady flow. And um, it's really important to remember, is my sample thixotropic if you want reproducible measurements? So let's think again about that yogurt. If I take a can of uh, a tub of yogurt from the fridge and I mix it up and make a measurement on it, it's going to look fairly low viscosity. Whereas if a colleague of mine takes the yogurt out and loads it very carefully without mixing it, then they're going to get a higher viscosity result just because they didn't mix the sample. So to get reproducible measurements in this case, we'd need to establish a test protocol which is common for everybody. Either we both mix it or the instrument mixes it. And then we watch, so this test you see is low shear, high shear, and then low shear again. Actually, this third section should always be reproducible because the samples have always been sheared before the low shear section. Um, 
So you can see whether the samples are likely to be thixotropic and think about that. Is that going to give you reproducible results or not? Okay, so in this summary, we've quickly looked at yield stresses, what they are and how to measure them. And then thixotropy, what that is, it's a time dependent shear thinning behavior. And so you can quantify the rebuild time of your sample. So hopefully this will help you. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to call us. Thank you for your attention.